Hello, this is Ukru Life, and we continue our broadcasting from Kiev, and we are very happy that our guest today is General Ben Holgers. General, good morning, and thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you again for the privilege, Lord Mello. Thank you. Uh, General, in 2022, after the successful action of Ukrainian army, we saw that Russia concentrated its efforts on south and east of Ukraine. Now we, saw the, we see the opposite process. We see the offensive on Kharkiv, concentration of forces and troops near the borders of Sumskaya Oblast, possible Kiev. What do you think is this uh, strategy or tactic of Russia and uh, what the enemy's chances? chances? Um, I think it looks to me like what Russia is trying to do is find different ways to take advantage of their numbers of artillery and, and people um, and to to try and, and stretch out Ukraine's defensive lines and then continue to um, try and overwhelm wherever they can. So applying pressure in a lot of places, I don't think I don't think that Russia has the ability to achieve a decisive breakthrough somewhere and, and knock Ukraine out of the war. Um, of course, uh, it's going to be relentless, especially uh, if when if Ukraine begins to uh, this ammunition hunger continues, if there's not enough ammunition uh, to enable Ukraine to to uh, shoot back adequate uh, effectively. Um, and of course, Ukraine is going to have to fix their uh, the size of the army. I mean, this there's there's no debate in a, in a war for survival. The government has got to change things to get more units, um, so that you can have rotation and training and and that sort of thing. But that's the Ukrainian side. On the Russian side, I really do think um, they're they're hoping to just eventually overwhelm. Ukrainian defenses. Uh, General, we see how enemy concentrated forces near our borders, and the situation raises the question of using the weapons of our partners on Russia's territory. Truly speaking, what is the problem, and is this problem could be solved? Well, I think this is a terrible policy, uh, a restriction by the United States um, that nobody I know that is reasonable uh, supports. Unfortunately, I think this this is a um, a consequence of the unwillingness of the administration to make it our policy, our strategic objective that Ukraine actually wins the war. And so the dominant the no, the dominant thought seems to be, as I look at it, seems to be, is to avoid doing something that would uh, provoke Russia into escalation, which really means using a nuclear weapon. And so I think this is very wrong-headed uh, policy and, and thinking by the White House. Uh, fortunately, there's growing pressure in the Congress and from other people to change this policy. But uh, And it probably does get changed eventually, but uh, months later than it should have happened. General, the problem here is that nuclear weapons will be the last argument any anywhere, you know, and any time. But what does it mean for us, for example? Well, uh, of course, uh, I have heard Ukrainian friends say that uh, just because Russia uses a tactical nuclear weapon, that will not stop Ukraine from continuing to fight. And I believe that. And I think actually there's almost no chance that Russia uses a nuclear weapon because there is no benefit to them to use a nuclear weapon. It's only the threat of using nuclear weapons that causes us to hesitate. That's where their real benefit comes from. So that, that's why I just <laughs> I think it is so uh, un, it's so unlikely that Russia would use a nuclear weapon, and and yet the administration continues to act like. That, that that's the most important thing is avoiding that. And I think that's unfortunate. 
General, uh, many Ukrainian officers and soldiers say that Russian's latest advance happened to a big extent due to their wide usage of precision guide bombs. Can we think about the, uh, any means again that? Well, I think it's obvious that uh, Ukraine does not have enough air and missile defense to be able to, to knock down Russian aircraft or these uh, different types of, of weapons that are being deployed. Um, and as uh, I believe, you know, you should be able to shoot the archer. It's better to to kill the archer instead of trying to knock down all the arrows, if that makes sense. So if you can kill where they're coming from, destroy the air base, destroy the launchers um, before the various weapons are deployed, that's an even better approach. So. Again, this goes back to uh, commitment by the United States to help Ukraine actually win. And by the way, it's not just the United States. It's UK, Germany, France, all the other countries as well that have a, that should have uh, a similar interest in helping Ukraine win. So it, whether or not the United States fails to pr provide what it should do, other countries, I mean, Europe, all the economies of Europe dwarfs Russia's economy. They have to step up as well. I have a special question from our uh, soldiers for you. Uh, let me quote it. On the role of drones in this war, how much are they changing the picture of this war? With widespread usage of FPVs by both sides, uh, does this mean drones are setting us in the trenches once again and any potential advance will be countered by a swarm of cheap drones are they the ultimate stalemate tool? Look, um, the history of warfare is each side trying to counter the other side. From the, the first time a guy ever picked up a sword and another guy picked up a shield. I mean, this, this is what it's been like for thousands of years. Uh, yes, drones, especially cheap mass numbers of drones, has changed the character of war, uh, but... Um, you know, even today, Ukrainians, Russians, Americans, others are working on ways to counter that. So I, um, I, I don't, I don't tend to, uh, I don't believe in saying, well, this one thing now has changed everything. I mean, people used to say that nuclear weapons have changed everything. You know, we lost two wars in Vietnam and Afghanistan, even though we were a nuclear power fighting against a much smaller uh, country. So uh, we should not be too quick to draw the wrong lessons, but yes, of course, um, figuring out how can you how can you operate, how can you protect your soldiers, and um, how can you uh, still be able to achieve your mission despite the other side having almost continuous observation of what's going on. So you become uh, very innovative. You have to protect yourself, but you also use deception uh, and you also go after the source, both from an economic, I mean, can you, through sanctions or attacks on infrastructure, what can you do to go after, to reduce the numbers of those uh, drones as well? Uh, General, uh, many experts say today that Russia is ready for a long war. How could you comment that and uh, how unpredictable is this war in principle? Well, I would I would turn that question around and say, is Ukraine ready for the long war? Is Ukraine doing everything it can to be prepared for a long war? I would say no. If you were, then you would have already fixed the mobilization system. You would have already improved the uh, training and education system. You would have already uh, changed the laws necessary to get more women and men into the armed forces so that you would have enough brigades to be able to have some sort of a rotation training um, instead of having to fight with everybody in there. And look, there are, there are millions of Ukrainians um, that are not in Ukraine or that are in Ukraine, but are still avoiding going into military service. So th this is part of it. If, if we're talking about a war of survival, a war of survival, has the government done everything necessary to recruit women and men 
to come into the armed forces. That means does a family, does a person believe that they will not be sent to the front as cannon fodder? Um, instead, they will be given proper equipment. They'll be properly trained. They'll be put into a unit that is properly trained. That's the, that's the responsibility of the government. And then, of course, also that a soldier, uh, a family knows that if something happens to their soldier, the family will still be taken care of. So this is Ukraine has a responsibility as well. It's not just about is the West providing enough weapons. Now, on the other hand, I think Russia uh, probably um, has decided or the Russians know that they cannot break through not in the, like in 1944, where they could just roll for hundreds of kilometers. I don't think they have that ability. But um, they, are, they are waiting to see if they can wear out or outlast not only Ukraine, but also the West. So certainly uh, they, are, they are prepared to, be, to do what they're doing now through 2025. It's after that that I'm not so confident that they have the... Uh, I mean, they're making decisions now where um, to do what they're doing now, but I don't think that can continue indefinitely is what I'm saying. Economic decisions, um, there's no denying they, they have solved uh, a lot of their recruiting or manning problems. Um, so, you know, the West, we, we've also got to help find ways to isolate Russia, uh, isolate Iran, uh, block uh, and put pressure on China to prevent China from being able to provide what Russia needs. So it's a comprehensive problem that will require commitment uh, by Ukraine as well as by um, Ukraine's supporters uh, on on diplomatic level, on economic level, as well as providing military capability. Do you think that a strong coalition um, of Russia, China and Iran is possible? Because, for example, some American officials say that some China weapons are on the battlefield right now. Well, China for certain is providing real capability to, to Russia. There's, there's no doubt about that. And Russian gas is somehow still getting out. Uh, Russian oil and gas is getting out to China and to India. So this is what I mean by the economic and diplomatic um, element of warfare. We have got to isolate Russia from being able to receive things, but also from being able to export oil and gas. So this, this is a problem that has not yet been solved. And I think that, again, stems from the fact that we don't have a total commitment to helping Ukraine actually win the war. So that's, that's part of this. Um, Iran is, is Russia's best ally and vice versa. Not so much China, but it, it's, it's Iran. Uh, European leaders have started talking about the preparation for the war with Russia in enforceable future. Doesn't mean that Russia getting stronger to, to, to have war with Ukraine right now. And uh, how would you comment this provocation with the change of border in borders in Baltic Sea? Well, there, this yep. is this is Russia testing, pushing, pushing to see if we're uh, if we have resolve. And and they will. This is what they always do. It's what they will continue to do. But I really wonder why. Why is the leaders of European countries and some leaders of NATO, for example, NATO, just start to speak about the potential war with Russia? Does Russia become stronger during this war? I would say that if, if this is the situation, it's only because we in the West allowed Ukraine to fail. Um, if Russia is not successful against Ukraine, then obviously they're not going to be in a position to attack NATO or even Moldova. Um, but I think it's it's prudent for nations to prepare for the possibility that Russia might continue. I mean, the Russians have said they they plan to do that. They want to do that. And we should take it very seriously. So obviously, the best way for NATO, for European countries to avoid a conflict with Russia is to help Ukraine win this war in Ukraine. Uh, but if that fails, then I would anticipate that the Russians will become stronger because they will absorb 
thousands of Ukrainian soldiers who will be forced into the Russian army. And, um, and then it will be a very serious situation. Uh, Romania has already said they will protect Moldova. So now you have one NATO ally that would be involved. I am pretty confident that Poland will not just sit back behind the Vistula River um, uh, as they see Russian army coming closer. So uh, it, it could um, it could turn into a, a much larger conflict. Um, again, this is why to me it's such an obvious thing is to help Ukraine actually defeat Russia. We should not we should not be scared of that happening. During last month, there are some uh, discussion about potential attack of Russia for NATO country. Do you think this is possible? Is it not a, is not ready? And uh, how fast could be the reaction of NATO? Because many say that it could be just a, 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 like a provocation from NATO to test the unity of NATO and to test the unity of West and others. Well, as I said, this only happens is if we allow Ukraine to fail. Otherwise, that scenario you just described, I don't believe will happen. But the Russians are clearly testing to see uh, what are we, you know, what are the limits? If they're trying to change the borders in the Baltic Sea, for example, or GPS jamming of airplanes over the Baltic Sea, if we don't actually respond and do something about it, then they will continue to do that. And, and uh, we have only ourselves uh, to blame. I will say that NATO itself is increasingly uh, is increasing its readiness levels. Nations are finally starting to get serious about defense spending and uh, ammunition procurement, but we still have a long way to go. European leaders have started talking about the sending uh, sending of some uh, troops to Ukraine. Do you think that it is a real scenario and uh, with what consequences it could happen? Well, um, I was glad when President Macron said that because, um, you know, it, it should give the Russians something to worry about instead of us always reacting to what they say or do, uh, whether or not he ever intends to actually send anybody. Um, I'm not against it at all. But I would ask before we ever send soldiers or sailors or airmen anywhere that we ask, what is the mission? And, uh, you know, we were in Afghanistan for 20 years and, and did not have a clear objective except for in the first year. And so if you don't have a clear objective for what it is you're trying to accomplish, then it's very difficult to have good um, uh, policy. And sending troops to do anything, whether it's logistics or medical or air defense or whatever, that's that's an important policy decision. But I would want to know what is the what is the ultimate objective that we're trying to achieve. And and this is the job of our civilian leaders to net, to clearly define the objective. Don't just send troops. But that's that's always what happens, though. They said the easy thing to do is to send troops or send airplanes or launch drones without ever having to clearly define the objective. What do you think could be the mission? Well, the, the mission should be to help Ukraine defeat Russia. That's that's the strategic objective. It's in our interest that Ukraine is successful. But so far, the president and the German Bundeskanzler and uh, the British prime minister and the French president have not said it's our objective. I mean, say it very clearly. They haven't done that yet. Uh, General, uh, uh, next uh, some experts say the next some next months will be crucial, critical for the end of the war. I agree with that. And do you think that next months will be very important? Well, of course they are. I mean, I mean every month is important because you've got soldiers that are in combat, you've got civilians that are being killed. So each month is crucial. Each month of delay is is uh, crucial. I think what's more important is what decisions, the next decisions, that's what's really crucial. And uh, the United States, Germany, uh, UK, France, deciding or not that we want Ukraine to win, that's the crucial decision. And deciding to lift restrictions and deciding to provide what's needed. 
and Ukraine deciding that they better get to work growing the size of the army. I mean, otherwise, you we are going to have a serious problem by the end of this year if Ukraine wastes any more time uh, on, on growing the size of its army. When you say about serious problem, what do you mean? I mean, you're going to run out of people. You're going to run out of soldiers. Units are going to be exhausted. And as they become more and more tired and units have more and more casualties over time, then they become less effective. And that's when the Russians, who, of course, do not care about casualties, their own casualties, will continue to press and press and press. So it is it, it is in the interest of Ukraine that they have more brigades that are trained and properly equipped so that they can have a rotation to pull a unit out for two or three months, to let it rest, to let it retrain, let it uh, get new equipment, and then put it back in. That that rotation is really very important. I mean, that, that's what we've always done in the First World War, the Second World War, and since, is a rotation. Uh, otherwise, they just get worn out, um, and, and eventually you become less effective. That's what I mean. General, and the last question, uh, during uh, these two years of this big war, we have different possible scenarios, more optimistic, more pessimistic, and what scenarios are possible right now, what do you think? Look, uh, we know that war is a test of will and it's a test of logistics. Uh, the American Revolution lasted eight years. I mean, it was eight years from when we first started in 1775 until the British finally sailed away, eight years. And we lost almost every battle in the middle. Uh, and the British had the biggest army, they had the greatest Navy in the world, uh, and we had none of that, um, but we had the will. And um, you know, then we lost the war in Vietnam, even though we had all the advantages of technology. And then we lost the war in Afghanistan, even though we had you know unlimited resources. So, um, I think there's there's a lot of very, very difficult days ahead, but people that are predicting something should step back a little bit and, and think, you know, read a history book and think about the human dimension of war. And as long as Ukraine Ukrainian people are committed to defending their country, there's no way that Russia can defeat them. But that commitment means more than just, you know, wearing blue and yellow ribbons, um, like, you know, like what I have on my uh, uh, briefcase. It means about doing everything that's necessary. And I think there are too many Ukrainians, wealthy Ukrainians, uh, driving around in France in nice big cars and, uh, and, and living and working in Germany and Poland that ought to be home in Ukraine. And this, this, will, this undermines, I hear more and more people talk about this now, this will undermine support of some countries for Ukraine if they see this disconnect that Ukraine expects the West to provide hundreds of billions of dollars of equipment and aid, but yet not every Ukrainian is personally invested in this fight. I mean, you still have Russian gas moving through pipelines across Ukraine. I, 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 <laughs> that's kind of difficult for me to reconcile. General, thank you so much to be with us. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege, Ludmilla. Thank you.